Hey guys, welcome back to the Foam for App Podcast. Tyler and Sam. Today I'm talking to Tom Boothelay. Tom's been on the show before. He was the EMS Battalion Chief for Hilton Head Fire and kind of a maverick in the high quality CPR, high performance CPR domain. So when I was re-recording the cardiac arrest section in studio, I was like, I want to pick his brain on a couple things because uh, Tom and I go back and forth all the time, text messaging each other. And there's a couple things that he had brought out regarding uh, bag valve mask uh, ventilation and the two hand technique utilizing end tidal CO2 to guide the resuscitation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play that part of the video. And then Sam and I are going to cut in somewhere towards the middle, maybe towards the end a little bit, when we start talking about the actual end tidal CO2 waveforms, and then like break those down and talk about those a little bit. So before we started, Sam, anything you want to preface it with? Any thoughts that you had going into it? Yeah, I liked all the talk about um, hand or bag valve mask ventilation, like with an actual mask. And I thought it'd be good just to point out a few things about troubleshooting that stuff because. Uh, we'll we'll break in, like you said, somewhere towards the middle about breaking down some new waveforms that maybe people haven't seen that are becoming kind of common to talk about. And uh, I had some trouble processing when I first saw them, like for sure. Yeah, I was like, you. Yeah. you really have to think about like what is going on in the chest when that occurs. But um, do you have that graphic for the leaks that I yeah, sent yep, you? Yeah, right here. Yeah. So this graphic was from one of the the lives that we did in one of the clinics. And you can see like the first waveform there is a very square waveform. And then you start to get these weird ones or they're just like humped or they have uh, like a divot in the middle and they're just like not well formed whatsoever. And I think that sometimes that might get a little bit confusing with these other ones. So that would be the first thing. Um, definitely have end tidal CO2 on anytime that you have any type of airway device on somebody and watch out for that. The reason that you get those different shapes and you don't have that really sharp, well deformed or well defined waveform is because to get that end tidal CO2 reading, obviously it has to go past the sensor. And so when the patient's exhaling, if only some of it is coming through, you're going to get a really weird waveform. And so it could be going out around the mask. And so that's like the first thing is you just be able to identify what does a leak or an obstruction look like. And then you and I were talking about, um, what if a patient has a really big beard? And I feel like this is, <laughs> there's two things, okay? Sam's got a revelation over here on how we <clears> should <throat> handle the, the Rip Van Winkle of uh, BVM. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And so like, if you have somebody that you, you really can't get a seal on, even if you're anticipating that, you know, maybe this is a shockable rhythm and this person, you know, good bystander CPR and they're going to wake up right away. I think that a superglottic airway earlier in those patients probably avoids a lot of trouble. But I was telling Tyler, I'm like, I wonder if anybody's ever shaved a beard with like a beard trimmer. And so we were <laughs> going back and forth on this. I'm like, dude, I could, I could shave a beard with a beard trimmer in, in 30 compressions. I guarantee you. So <laughs> <they're> not... <laughs> and I, and I, I kind of want to see him do it. Like, I want to see how it, how it comes out. If you can pull this off. Well, the next time, um, the next time we meet up, I think that you should play the patient and then we'll, we'll do a little, we'll do a little <laughs> simulation. No, no, I, you need a real beard, man. I, I, I just trim mine. You need something that's, uh, that's like legit. You need something like Ben has, mm -hmm. or one of our developers, you know, just a big ZZ top type beard and Sam mm -hmm. will go in there like Edward scissor hands. And then, mm -hmm. you know, 30 within a couple compressions, he'll come out looking like this. <laughs> 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 you uploaded that just for that punchline just, literally you? just did it just now yeah <clears throat> yeah but i um i'd like to see somebody propose that i mean with without the potential for airway obstruction because I, I think that honestly i don't know <laughs> dude can you imagine oh, yeah. you, what, what did you do on that code oh i got the io and i got the uh, the intubation what'd you do oh you know i was i did the shocks i was on drugs what'd you do oh, i gave him a haircut <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing to, to shave the chest for a good 12 lead can we shave the beard <laughs> can we shave the beard for a good mask seal in the event that that we absolutely need to i don't know i think i don't know why it's not on the table i'm just have you seen the saran there. wrap thing i don't think you're gonna get a good at gas exchange with saran wrap over their face dude no, no, no you know, the saran wrap goes you put the saran wrap over their mouth right with like some lubricant jelly it goes over 
and then you pop a hole in the mouth and you pull it open and then you use the saran wrap with the BVM over that. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. In yeah. my <laughs> you're right. You're right. Let's get some uh, some shaving cream and let's give this guy. Not nice shaving cream. I'm talking about a beard trimmer. You know, like like what <laughs> somebody would use to like blade trim around or? your ears. No guard, and you just all of a sudden, I'm telling you, in 30 compressions, you could have it done. Brush it off to the side, and all of a sudden, and then you're you gonna be nice dude. You're gonna have hair after. flying all over the place, and then my it's gonna be in my ultrasound gel for me trying to look at the guy's art. <laughs> well, here's retro it's gonna be like when somebody cuts down one of those uh those down jackets, dude. Except it's gonna be just facial hair everywhere. All you need is a decanto suction, dude. You you start just suction the hair. Thing. <laughs> and you suction the hair out while you're doing it. Okay, but getting serious. So it's yeah, no, ridiculous. Really, if, if the person has a big beard, I think like going super glottic would be a better fix like right away rather than playing around with that for a long time or, or putting a plastic bag over the patient's head or whatever you were just saying. <laughs> but um, okay, and then the last thing about seals is um, if what do you think about five hand CPR and that? Because I I was waiting for you guys to maybe bring that up, but I don't think that that's part of like the national curriculum for what he was talking about with the, um, what do you call it, the CPR Academy? What is the, the yeah. thing that he was talking about? Oh, the, uh, the like the high quality CPR. Thing yeah, the academy that you can take. CPR. I don't know. If, yeah, so for the people who don't know, like five hand CPR is the person up at the head only holds a two hand seal so that they got, like they're only focused on the seal and then the bag valve mask is, is kind of just hanging off or maybe like resting on the arm or something. And then the person who's doing compressions goes like 28, 29, 30, and they can just leave one hand on the chest and then just reach up and do one, two, and then go right back to CPR. And that way the person with who's doing compressions and the person who's doing bagging, you have totally avoid the one hand seal thing, which can be like really difficult in some patients. And you don't have to worry about the person at the head coordinating with the person doing CPR. That's obviously like something a crew would have to practice. I'm not telling anybody to like go out and rogue this and then spring it on somebody all of a sudden when you're doing CPR. Okay, you're going to do compressions? All right, check this out, man. I'm just going to hold the seal. Now you grab up the bed. Like it would definitely yeah. be like something you should practice. But I think in with seals, like, yeah, definitely make sure you know what the, uh, the leak looks like. If they have a beard or something or, or just r for some reason really hard to bag, one option would be going super glottic earlier. And the second option would maybe be trying that five hand CPR thing if you if you're trained in it and that's something you're comfortable with. Cool. All right. So we're going to play the podcast. And then when we get to the waveforms, we're going to cut in and talk about that. And when we come back, Tyler won't have a beard <laughs> <laughs> or pants. <laughs> well, the, the reason that your name came to mind is because right now I'm re-recording the cardiac arrest section. And so I'm doing an update. We try to like re-record sections like every two years or so. And I was just talking in the class about uh, like diastolic pressures and coronary perfusion pressures and the goal. But the thing is, is like the average provider is not going to have an arterial line placed inside their cardiac arrest patient, right? I mean, outside of the ICU, that's not that common. And so something that you can use as a marker of, you know, adequate compressions and making sure that you're hitting certain benchmarks is end tidal CO2. And that's uh, widely used now, or at least it should be during cardiac arrest. And so I wanted to pick your brain a little bit and see how your team, because you had a very high performing team at Hilton Head, how you guys used end tidal CO2 in your workflow approaching a cardiac arrest. And we'll take it before you even have an advanced airway, like you get on scene, you grab your BVM, at what point are you attaching the end tidal CO2? And then how did that guide your resuscitation? That's great. I love this question because very frequently our cardiac arrest patients never received tracheal intubation. You know, we only really did that if we felt they needed tracheal intubation. And many of our bystander witnessed shockable cardiac arrest patients, what we came to find out is from an airway management perspective, anything we do to the patient might have to be undone if we get ROSC and they have return of airway reflexes. Otherwise, you'd say, okay, well, why don't we just medicate the patient to facilitate the tube? Well, now they're gonna flunk their neuro exam. Right. Um, and now they might be subjected to targeted temperature management, whether they need it or not. And now maybe a risk averse cardiologist doesn't wanna take the patient to the cardiac cath lab until the neuro status is known. So we can, over medicalize it and and um and, and downstream consequences 
So, so it's like if everything's going beautifully with an OPA and a BVM in a bystander wit witness shockable cardiac arrest, if we get them back on the third shock and they have a return of airway reflexes and then we switch them out to a non-rebreather mask and put them in a semi-fowlers or something like that and they're conscious and talking by arrival in the emergency department, then without a doubt, if that can happen, then we should let that happen. That it doesn't mean that patients don't require intubation. Some patients do require intubation or some people have a soiled airway. Many other reasons you might choose to, to intubate or use an eye gel or something sure, like yeah. that. But our bread and butter on Hilton Head we were very intentional about saying, we're gonna be a department that masters BLS. And let's not ever assume that because BLS means basic life support that using a BVM is easy. It's not, it's a complicated piece of medical equipment and you should be a lifelong student when it comes to ventilation and train on instrumented mannequins and use all the tools at our disposal. For patients that are conscious, that's definitely gonna include SpO2 um, and CO2. So the first thing I would encourage people to do is anytime you're using artificial ventilation, doesn't matter if it's BLS or ALS or a tracheal tube or just a BBM, always use capnography. Always use, you know, consider it a BLS tool and, and consider it any time that I'm squeezing a bag, there should be capnography attached if you have that capability. If you're a first responder on the fire engine, you got an AED and oxygen, maybe you don't have capnography. But anyone capable of measuring a capnogram and they're squeezing a bag like this, they should be doing it because you're going to get very familiar with those waveforms. You're going to use it all the time and you're going to get really good at troubleshooting it or like, is this an accurate reading? Are we sure this is an accurate reading? And, you, and you'll get much, much better at troubleshooting. So what we'll do, get a new adult BVM and we'll open up the bag and we'll pre-attach the capnography so we don't aren't scrambling looking for it and uh, we train it at the EMT level so that everyone has a common mental model of what a sick patient is supposed to receive, you know, and, and one of those things is, is definitely capnography. Awesome. So you guys go in, you already have the entitled CO2 on, you got your BVM, and is the BVM, is that a one person skill or is that something that you guys use the, the thumbs down or thumbs up technique and use two providers to assure you have a good seal. How does that typically, and I'm sure it probably depends on your resources. You know, if you only got two yeah. people that are there right away, but typically there's a law enforcement officer or a firefighter, somebody that can help out. Everyone's trained in both. So every time we, tr we train adult high performance CPR, everyone learns how to get a basic seal on recession, you know, using like a CE mm -hmm. maneuver. We'll also show the Ducanto trick to, you know, use the V and then grab the end of the chin so you can relax your hand because some people, their hand starts to cramp mm -hmm. if they're really trying to hold that CE and it's not quite right. A couple of minutes go by and they're just not able to do it anymore. So we'll show them a CE. We'll show them, I guess, what I'll call VE. I don't know if it's really E. You're grabbing the chin. I think you've seen that trick. Yeah, kind of like the power grip. Yeah, where he yeah, reaches. So nice. It is so nice. And for some people, that is how they have to do it, depending on the size of their hand and stuff like that. But some people, for whatever reason, just cannot hold a good seal. I don't know why. Some people just can't. For those folks, yeah, we, we used to call it two thumbs down. Now we call it two thumbs up, just because from our perspective, our thumbs are up. But that's, that's you know, it's not double CE. It, it is just grabbing the jaw and then your thumbs on our other side of the mask. And what we have found out, no matter how good you are at holding a seal, there are times that it's just important to hold the two-handed mask seal because every patient's different. Some you can ventilate quite easily with a BVM and an OPA. Other people, due to facial hair or just the size and shape of their face and their mouth, or maybe you're just having a bad day, anybody can have that patient that they just can't quite get that good seal on. And so often using the two-handed mask seal uh, solves the problem. So I think you should, I think paramedics should be skilled in both. But again, remember our goal on Hilton Head was to just absolutely master BLS. That means having a contingency plan and, a, and another. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're doing it with the CE and it's not quite working. Well, you try the VE, that's not quite working. We go to a two-handed and someone else squeezes it back. Ah, oh, that did the trick. Or, you know, oh, well, maybe we'll use an, an NPA and an OPA. Maybe that works a little bit better. So first thing you should do when you're troubleshooting BLS that's not going well is better BLS. You don't have to jump straight 
um, to a tracheal tube. You should slow down a little bit and try different techniques. Um, you know, again, assuming that you don't have a soiled airway. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we just got really, really, really good at those basics. And what we found also is I think there was a benefit to advanced airway management as well. The better we got at the basics, I think the wiser we were with our choices in who required an eye gel or a tracheal tube. They started looking at a little more systemically, not so much like, you know, you'll take away my tube out of my cold, dead hand, but more like open-minded, like this patient needs oxygenation and ventilation. That's what the patient needs. There's more than one way to do that. And I think there's a um, argument to be made in medicine that we should do the minimally effective intervention no matter what we're doing. And so if everything's going beautifully with an OPA and a BVM and compressions, and so, so now it's like we're doing compressions, we're doing ventilations, and we're doing defibrillation, and it's all going beautifully. That's great. That's great. Uh, I wish you your next cardiac arrest that it goes beautifully. <laughs> like it. It, you know, it, work. it works well, you know. The question that comes up is, you know, I, I know a lot of people like to put in an advanced airway because then they can switch to continuous chest compressions as opposed to doing like a 30 to 2. Were you guys doing the 30 to 2 or were you guys doing continuous chest compressions and then even without an advanced airway? You ask really awesome questions. I love this. So, um, you know, we on Hilton had decided a long time ago, uh, especially on the rock study that did a randomized trial between so-called BLS continuous. Some people have called them upstroke ventilations. I don't really like that because you kind of have to start the ventilation on the dome stroke and then it goes in. Yeah, on the upstroke. there's a lot of timing. <laughs> yes. We teaching high performance CPR around the country have found tremendous variability in the ability of EMS systems to successfully pull off BLS continuous. Some do it quite well. And some, when we have used instrument and mannequins show, you know, maybe half the breaths aren't really going in like, like we thought. And so if you're going to do that, which is fine, um, then, then I would just say, make sure those breaths are going in, use instrumented mannequins. And really it, it is more difficult. It's not more effective. We have a randomized trial showing it's not more effective. Okay. So we've made the decision, well, we're going to stay with 30 and two, because if it's a drowning or an asphyxial arrest, there are patients that definitely the ventilations are more important. And in communication with people that had gone through CPR university in Arizona or just systems that had, had adopted, maybe they call it minimally interrupted cardiac resuscitation. Now they used to call it CCR, but you know, just, you know, six minutes of just compressions, and then maybe we'll switch to some other thing. Then you bump up against patient selection. The history of the rest isn't always perfectly obvious when you arrive on scene. And sometimes the history comes out minutes later, and you've already decided we're going to omit ventilations or not. We decided that everybody's going to receive ventilations the exact same way. I mean, obviously 15 and two for kids, but all adults are getting 30 and two, all comers, but we're we're going to make sure that they are really, really good chest compressions, really expert, you know, ventilation, squeeze, release, squeeze, release, pinky up, only 350 to 500 milliliters. Uh, and we're only stopping for, you know, two seconds for two breaths. And so it's high performance CPR 30 and two. Mm. In the old days, before we measured it with code stat, we found out, you know, you might be taking five seconds to give those two breaths or the person on compressions is staring at the person doing the ventilations, waiting for them to finish. If anything, we have to advise tactical patients on the person on compressions because they're, you know, they, you're doing compressions at a cadence of 110, right? So your metronome's going, it's going like this, okay? So your tendency when they stop CPR to give two ventilations is to allow two of those, but it's not, it's two seconds. So you're on this tempo of 110, 28, 29, 30, we have them say out loud, squeeze, release, squeeze, release. Otherwise, that metronome going on in the background will, will make you accelerate that moment and not give them that honest two seconds. So that's what we ask. Sometimes that helps. Just say the word, squeeze, release, squeeze, release, and then you're on to your next, you know, 30 and two. If you do that and you manage the peri shock pause, I mean, that's what we call high performance CPR. You're taking care of rate, depth, recoil, ventilation, and peri shock pause. Ta-da! 
Yeah, and I would imagine out. I would imagine that giving that breath over that one second is really important when you don't have an advanced airway in because of gastric insufflation that you can get with that. So if you're giving it nice and slow, you're not as likely to pop open that esophageal sphincter that, I don't know, they say it opens up around 20, 25, you know, whatever. Yeah, the airway pressures can be lower, uh, but you're not squeezing the bag very much either. So it it really is just squeeze, release, squeeze, release. It's very simple. It's slow, smooth, simple, but it can easily be done in two seconds. And then everyone's definitely getting the ventilations and you're getting capnography. And you know what I mean? It's a, it's a good base. Mm-hmm. It's a good base, you know, and it works for everybody. Again, we would do 50 and two, and two for kids. But, you know, mo- we, we, we had very, very good success with, with this ventilation strategy, for sure. We're in a unique uh, situation up here in, in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area with ECMO because we'll get called out, um, the flight team will actually get called out for a patient who's in refractory VTVF, and it'll be an ECMO activation. And when we get there, I mean, sometimes they've already been working the patient for 25, 30 minutes, and they're in refractory, they're, you know, had good CPR. And the ventilation aspect becomes so important because when we take that patient and they're on the Lucas and we put them in the helicopter and we're flying them to get to to uh, to get cannulated for ECMO, as soon as you get them to the U of M, the University of Minnesota, um, they draw a arterial line or they do an art like an art stick and they draw a gas and if the PCO2 and the PAO2 and every lactate are just completely out of whack. They won't even put them on pump at that point. And so it was interesting to see, because I remember very early on, uh, there was something called like, I think it was CCR was just, they would put an oral airway in a non rebreather and they would just do chest compressions. And I think it was you that was, that you said like the first few minutes of continuous chest compressions, that's for the bystanders. That's not for not for EMS. Like we should obviously be thinking about the ventilation aspect. Wasn't that you that mentioned that? Well, that, that was actually, um, I asked the question, right? So, so I'd been to CPR university had already been to Seattle King County once. And, um, I did know that there can be a problem where I know two departments now that have had to retrain to make sure that your patient selection is correct. If you're going to do MICR, but, but if your troops are just like, oh, man, I believe in this, this works, and they just start doing it on everybody, well, we can all agree that's not appropriate for an asphyxial arrest, for example. So I'm like, well, this is interesting. You know, what about, isn't it true that a run-of-the-mill sudden cardiac arrest on the tennis court, you've got this reservoir of fresh oxygenated blood. It can be circulated for, you know, four minutes, certainly, probably six minutes without ventilations. Um, But then in theory, based on animal models, you'll eventually develop atelectasis, which will, you know, impede right-sided circulation and, and, you know, cardiac output will start to go down if you don't ventilate at all, eventually, according to animal studies and things like that. So when I got back to Seattle, I just kind of, hey, what do y'all think? Um, What do you think about, and, and, you know, they're always very um, tactful when they answer questions like this because Ben Bobro is a legend in the resuscitation field and an ally, and they're all friends. So this isn't like against CPR University. It's just like, what do you all think about this? And Peter Kudenchuk, um, one of their EMS physicians there, he's al- also an electrophysiologist out in Seattle. He's like, look, yes, you're right. You can circulate that fresh oxygenated blood for maybe up to six minutes, but that's not for us. What is your response time? You know, it's probably six minutes. Right. And so hopefully your telecommunicator is coaching your bystander to use that reservoir to do those chest compressions while you're in route. That is how your system should be striving to function. So if, you know, and and assuming that has happened, then yeah, it's by the time you get there, it's time to blow off some CO2. Mm Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And and that makes a lot of sense from the aspect too, that you said you don't always know what caused the arrest. You don't know if it was a respiratory arrest and they don't have a lot of oxygen reserves left inside. So I think that's, that's, um, that seems to fit my mental model as well as to, we make sure that we have adequate chest rise and fall. I feel like if you're doing continuous chest compressions throughout BLS, like just with the BVM, that end tidal CO2 is really your confirmation that you're exchanging gas. You're exchanging, you know, oxygen for CO2. 
And so I'm curious if you, let's say that uh, you responded with your team when you're on Hilton Head and you had a patient that was, you know, 40 something years old, went down mowing the yard, had CPR, bystander CPR right away. And you get there and he's in a V-fib rhythm and maybe he fails the first shock. You got your BVM and tidal CO2 on it. What are you expecting? If there's been decent CPR, what what are you expecting for an end tidal CO2? And what would shock you as being like, wow, that's really low? For a patient like the one you described, I'd expect it to be at least mid-20s, um, maybe higher with high-performance CPR. That's our experience. Uh, we have excellent response times. We have worked really hard with our telecommunicators to make sure that they have the confidence to provide CPR instructions. We've done a lot of work on that. And so, yeah, I would expect that to be mid twenties, maybe higher. So let's say you get there and the, the chest compressions look pretty good. Um, but it's like, you know, it's like eight or it's like 10. And I would, I would think there's definitely something wrong. So that could be airway positioning, mask seal, quality of chest compressions. Um, that would be an irritant in my mind. <laughs> for sure. No, I, like that, that, I, like, I like that. An irritant yeah. in my mind. Yeah, that would yeah. something you're wanting to fix right away. So that's what yeah. I'm wanting to tap into your workflow for that. So you look over and you see you have uh, one firefighter paramedic uh, bagging, you know, and he's got the seal yeah. and he's holding it um, yeah. you, immediately. What's your, what's your first thought? It's a great, great example of why we need to send more people and send supervisors and or advanced practice paramedics or, you know, you should send a nice response to a call like that. Um, a, a bystander witnessed cardiac arrest is, is a big deal, you know, so, so just throwing this out there, you know, what are you sending to a call like that? Because if you have an experienced clinician that can approach the scene and look and be like, Hey, wait a minute, what's that entitled CO2? Oh, wow. It's only 12 or something like that. And you're like, this was a witness collapse or a bystander CPR. It's a youngish patient, seemed to be doing pretty well prior to the collapse. Why, 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 why? Now, what I would do is I would look over at the person on airway. You know, is this a new person? Is this a tenured person? Mm -hmm. Someone I would normally expect to be doing really well on the airway. We train everybody. So everyone's trained to the same standard. Don't get me wrong. But if it's a brand new person versus one of your very best paramedics, you're going to look at that a little bit differently. But yeah, let's say it's absolutely. an average average person on the on, on their way i'm gonna look and i'm gonna look for cheek fluttering i'm gonna listen for air leaking i'm gonna ask them hey how's compliance mm -hmm. you know we throw this word around compliance what does that mean to you when you're operating a bvm tyler Wait, Com is compliance for me i mean I, I hate using the bvm for compliance but you know i you know obviously i like to use a ventilator for it cuz i feel like it's so subjective but if you're using a bvm you know how hard is it to squeeze the bag you know if you're squeezing it and you're not buying much recruitment for this amount of pressure this amount of kinetic force then either the airway is not open or there's something wrong with the lungs or just not the airway yeah but like do you think that there's something that maybe it's ineffable that maybe you couldn't train someone else but with experience there's a certain feeling in your fingers, right? When the air is going into the lungs and coming back out. And then if you've got good tube fogging and like you see the chest rise, there's a whole bundle of sensations that you have when you're, when you're ventilating somebody and you're like, yeah, I just know this is going into lungs versus this is really hard or I don't have a good seal. So it's first thing I would think if I let's say I'm the person on the airway, how is my compliance? Does the air seem to be going in and out really easily? Is there good tube fogging? Do I see some chest rise? Like I'll have that sensation that, hey, I don't know why it's so low. Everything seems to be going fine. But if you look at the person and they look like they're struggling, they look like their hands cramping, they don't appear confident and you have a low reading like that, what I would do is just say, ask them to temporarily switch to a, you know, a two thumbs up and make sure the airway's open. And maybe I would come over and squeeze the bag and then we would look at the monitor together and look at the waveform and uh, and see if the number goes up and very often the number does go up and then that's your real entitled co2 the one that you had before was a warning that maybe you know not maybe you had a bad seal something like that and then of course you can also look at the compressions yeah how how good is the rate depth recoil you know because you know we, why is it low there's how many reasons could there be impaired cellular respiration uh, impaired pulmonary perfusion. Um, yeah. why would you have those issues? Right. 
so so it's like it's 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 probably either the quality of the chest compressions or the quality of the mask seal yeah and um, before we move on to the circulation i want to because I, I think something you just said is super important um yeah compliance is how easy is it to squeeze the bag um but you also mentioned like the chest dries and that's super important and having end tidal co2 right so i remember in when i used to teach acls i would take the bag and i'd put it on a table and I would ventilate it and I'd be like, squeeze it. How does it feel? And they'd be like, oh, it feels really good. And I'm like, yeah, but you're ventilating the table. You know, if you don't have a good seal, you can't really go off of the compliance because it could be leaking out around the mouth. So you have to have both a good seal and still be able to squeeze that bag. So that's, I think, a really important point. And I then when so. it comes to the, yeah. um, oh, sorry, did you have something else to add on to that? Only this is why you should always use it not just with advanced airways, use it all the time, make it part of your basic BLS armamentarium so you get really comfortable every time you use a BBM getting that feedback. Yeah, absolutely. And then when it comes to, all right, so let's say your end tidal CO2 looks good. It's not like you have, um, I'm sure we've all had like a patient who vomits and then you have like some traces of it in the sample port and you have to switch it out. So make sure it's clean, it's not contaminated, it's going to the monitor, you got nice seal, you're ventilating, you got good chest rise and fall. It's still low at that point. Then you're looking at, like you said, the chest compressions and it could be the rate. It could be the depth. It could be uh, the position of it is something that I found as well. You know, one of the things as I learned ultrasound and started doing like cardiac ultrasound is everybody's heart is in a different spot. I mean, I, there's this one nurse that we work with that uh, Kate Spice, I'm going to call her out. Her heart's like all the ways on the right side. And I'm like, man, if I was doing chest compressions over here, I wouldn't even be hitting the left ventricle. And that I think is a really important point because when you put the Lucas on, there's a tendency to, all right, let's put it right here, hit go, and it starts going. And if your end title is low, you're like, oh, you know, it must just, they must have been down for a while. I've had it to where I've completely repositioned it based off of what I've seen on ultrasound. And then the end title is great. And so it, I'm sure it goes the same way with manual compressions as well. Have you ever noticed that you're compressing one area and you're like, maybe that's too high. You change up the compression location and then you see an increase in end title CO2. Well, I've certainly seen that when we've swapped out compressors, like one person, their body mechanics and their hand position, everything looks just fine but they've just rotated in and oh, entitled, sure. you know, you know and, and title CO2 was 28. And now it's 18. You're like, hmm. you're, you're getting different angles of, of their hand and the heel of their hand <laughs> and their elbow. And you're like, you're, you're looking at them. And sometimes you just got to swap them back out. You know? Yeah. I, I've seen compressions that look great and it's just like, Hey, <laughs> you're, 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 you're a great, you're a great EMT or paramedic. No offense, man, but we got to change a variable here and see what happens. And then you swap them out and it's back at 28. So it's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why it looked that way at that time. It's not personal, right? But it's a team accountability. And I think one of the biggest principles of high performance CPR is we don't think of ourselves as individuals anymore. We're a team doing high performance CPR. So you don't get to walk past poor chest compressions or walk past poor ventilations or walk walk past a dropping in tidal CO2. It's a team accountability. And so everyone's been trained to be approachable. Everyone's been trained that it's an expectation that you speak up. Everyone's been trained that it's a team accountability. So working as a team using crew resource management, we're going to resolve the problem and everyone's going to check their ego at the door. And then we're going to talk about it after. You know, that that's that's it. Rinse and repeat all the time, getting better all the time. And uh, and that's how you do it, you know, and, and it's it's very successful. It's good for morale, too. Yeah. You know, because there's no topic we won't discuss. Yeah. Nobody and, takes personal offense to it. They just look at it as you're just helping. You know, it's, everybody's working for the greater good and trying to take care of the best, the best thing and, for the patient. And the days of people abusing their rank or their privilege is gone. Yeah. Like, you Flat know, hierarchy. It, it was your call, but then the captain showed up and bulldozed you and took the call in a direction that you didn't like, and it felt a little bit bullying, and, and you're upset about it. Guess what? We're going to have a conversation about that. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Scott Weingart, Dr. Weingart from MCRIT, he just had on a guest, and they were talking about end tidal CO2 tracings in 
cardiac arrest. And so I was going to put up a couple of these. I wanted to see what you thought of them. So this was the one that they mentioned was like during compression. So you have like these oscillations that are occurring while you're doing those chest compressions. And obviously, you know, towards the end, you start to see it die down. But they mentioned this one here that I thought was interesting. This was intrathoracic airway closure. And it started off really low. And then you see it slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what I thought was interesting about this is they were talking about when you're doing chest compressions, you're operating below the functional residual capacity. So you can have certain airways that de-recruit, like you were mentioning, the atelectasis that can occur. And then when you go to ventilate, it takes some time before you actually get that CO2 out. So this was one where it like slowly, it almost looks like um, like your uh, like the shark fin waveform for bronchospasms or asthmatics. And yeah. so you can see it slowly starts to climb up and then it finally gets to the point to where it's recruited. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was this one, and this was thoracic distension. And you can see like the end of it looks normal, but in the beginning, you're not seeing your oscillations. And that's if you have way too much volume inside the lung that it seems like the first couple compressions are just getting that volume down. And then mm -hmm. it switches to like the, uh, the regular oscillations like you would see uh, during here. But I, I just thought that was interesting because I've, I've never learned that before. And they did a really nice paper. I can't pronounce the, uh, the clinician's name that did this thesis on the different end tidal CO2 waveforms, but um, it does look different, right? It's not going to look like your typical end tidal CO2 waveform because you're doing chest compressions on that. If you're doing, you know, 30 to two, then obviously that'll look a little bit that uh, that'll look the same. It shouldn't have the oscillations, but it sounds like that's not what you guys are doing either. Those continuous chest compressions are trying to help you restore that coronary perfusion pressure. Well, that last graphic, I, I have not seen that phenomenon. Okay. But the first one that just kind of shows more shark fin appearance. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see like little oscillations on it. That's pretty normal to be honest with you for what bag mask ventilation looks like using an OPA and the patient's not intubated, whether they're, well, the oscillations added on top because of the compressions, right? But the patient was just being, you know, um, pre-oxygenated for RSI or something like that, um, then, then you wouldn't have those little oscillations. But even then with a BVM, you might have that leading edge of the alveolar, alveolar plateau. Mm -hmm. You know, it would look a little bit more like a shark fin. Then once you intubate, then it goes to looking boxy. Mm -hmm. So, and until I learned that, there were times that I'm like, I wonder if this patient has, you know, COPD. Not really sure. <laughs> Why does it look a little bit shark finned? It's just something that happens with the BBM and an OPA. I'm not entirely sure why. All right. So let's break down these waveforms a little bit. So I'm going to pull up the uh, the first one. This is like the normal during compressions, oscillations. You can see it's starting to slowly like go down a little bit. So this one is, is pretty easy to explain, right? You're doing chest compressions on top of uh, the patient exhaling. So you're going to get these os oscillations. And if you're doing 30 to 2, obviously, it's not going to look like this. It's going to look like a normal waveform. Um, but then we get into some of the weird stuff, right? So the first one was this one. And this is intrathoracic airway closure. This may be a little bit weird to wrap your head around, like, what's actually happening here. Yeah, so that was the most difficult one for me to, to wrap my head around. And because um, I had to think about intrathoracic airway closure. And you start thinking, like, in your brain... And it does kind of look like that too. You start thinking about bronchospasm right away. And it's not terribly different than bronchospasm. Um, I was looking up some graphics on Google images and stuff like that. And it turns out it's really similar to like bronchiectasis or bronchiomalacia where if a person's had like, let's say um, a, a bunch of like uh, a bunch of bouts of pneumonia or if they have maybe like long-term um, bronchitis, like chronic bronchitis and stuff recurrent infections can start to weaken the walls of the bronchioles or you could have other diseases that do it as well but they run into this thing where when they when they try to force air out of their lungs the alveoli and it's like the general lung parenchyma as they start to squeeze that out and they create that positive airway pressure they go Whoosh. the lung parenchyma actually squeeze down on their own airways and they actually end up fighting themselves and the harder they try to exhale and the more pressure they generate in their chest, 
it actually squeezes down on their airways more. And so in those patients, at least live patients, positive end expiratory pressure on a bag valve mask or CPAP or whatever. Yeah, that's a good one. So like that bottom right one there, in increased intrapleural pressure. You can see like the parenchyma is squeezing down on the small airways. And so in live patients that they benefit from positive pressure on the way out, like PEEP or CPAP or whatever, um, to hold those open so that when they try to forcefully exhale, they're not fighting against themselves. So that's how I understood that, but that did not click in my head right away. Um, did they have a proposed like mechanism as to why that would happen? Is it because of one of those underlying conditions? Did they specify that? It, well, it sounded like if you're operating at a very low functional residual capacity. And so it's easier for those airways to close when you're dealing with really low lung volumes. Okay. And it, at the uh, the end of the MCRIT podcast where it's uh, Weingart, he, and I can never pronounce the guy's name who was the guest on there, but he was talking about how when you have this airway closure, you know, typically when you push down on the chest, you know, during the compression phase, you're pushing air out. And then during the recoil phase, you know, you're, you're taking, essentially you're taking air back in and that's where like the impedance threshold device would prevent that. And you'd actually suck the blood. But if you have a bunch of air trapped on the other side of the closure inside the alveoli during the inhalation phase, when you push down, when you come back up, instead of pooling blood, you're going to actually just be pooling gas. And so it sounded like the majority of the reason this happens is because you're dealing with low lung volumes. You have a lot of intrapleural pressure, as you were discussing, because you're doing chest compressions. You know, you think about somebody with a, a very large chest or maybe a, a very high transalveolar pressure, you know, and then imagine you're pushing that down. It can cause that airway collapse on top of it. Okay. So that makes sense. So is that, that, and that was one you guys are talking about that maybe in this instance, a little bit of peep on the bag valve mask might just keep as, the airways as open counterintuitive yeah. as that sounds might be the lesser of two evils if you're able to keep the airways open a little bit and wait a second are are we saying that peep stents open bronchioles now if you're pushing on the chest <laughs> <it does>. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right if you're actively decompress you know doing active exhalation yes I, sure, I believe sure. okay all right i'm with you i'm with you all right let's do that last one all right the last one is uh, thoracic distension and so uh here you can see like the first couple compressions you're not really seeing the oscillations as much and that's purely just because there's so much air within the uh, thoracic compartment so within the lungs you're hyperinflated. And then as you start to like, you know, you're pushing it out, you start to see more of those oscillations on there. Okay. So basically at the beginning of that waveform, like the patient is exhaling, somebody's starting to do compressions again. And because there's the chest is so overinflated, you know, the tissue around it and everything can compress. But I mean, you're monitoring actively the airway. And so because that air isn't going to you don't have enough force to actually like collapse that air you're not seeing the compressions because there's so much air in there some of that air has to leave before the system can even start to register those oscillations again right yeah and, and the way i think of it is is like you know within a lung unit you know there's a certain amount of air and co2 but you can absolutely hyper inflate alveoli and mm -hmm. you'll have way more air than you actually have CO2 because it's not like mm -hmm. a linear correlation. So you have way more volume in there. And so when you actually push down, it's a very diluted type waveform to where you're not seeing as much the chest compressions because on the way in, when you're actually like causing air to suck in, they're just sucking in the same air that they had in before, right. which would have been dead space ventilation. Sure. All right. Those may, those make a lot more sense now. Yeah. I'd, when I first looked at those, like the normal one made sense. The one where it's like hyperinflated at first made a lot of sense. But yeah, the the um, intrathoracic airway closure, okay. that one was the most confusing for sure. But it is almost, it is kind of analogous to, to bronchospasm almost. It's bronchial constriction just from a different, from a mechanical compression from the outside. So I guess those are a little bit analogous. It just wouldn't be... Uh, wouldn't be beneficial to give them a nebulizer treatment, right? So yeah, those make a lot more sense now. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to shave their beard, you might also give them. <laughs> there might, might be an airway irritant that needs to be, uh, needs to be relaxed a little bit later. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the episode. And, and maybe the technology will uh, exist someday for each 
patient to get individualized parameters like they do in more advanced environments or with the help of things like, you know, bedside echo and whatnot. I think I always looked at it in terms of like, what, what should be our strategy across a broad, undifferentiated population? What type of CPR should they receive? Surely it should be the best possible we can deliver uh, in, in, unless we have evidence to the contrary. And so we, we just did it based on what we thought were the best practices and, and the techniques we learned at the Seattle King County Resuscitation Academy, implemented them, measured it. And to me, the ultimate outcome is how many patients survive to hospital discharge with good functional capacity. Um, and, and so if you're doing well with that measurement, then you're a little bit loath to change anything. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. That makes sense. Well, Tom, thanks so much for coming on, man. You've been a staple in, uh, my understanding and I'm sure others in cardiac arrest and high performance CPR. So uh, keep kicking ass, man. And I appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Tyler.